um, the English novelist Somerset Maugham said, there are three rules for good writing. Unfortunately, nobody knows what they are. <laughs> and we might, uh, that has a lot to do with historians as well. We have a lot of great tools uh, that we use to do our research to find out what happened back in the day. Uh, at, but in the end, uh, we have to decide the, uh, who's telling the truth, who's not telling the truth, uh, which sources mean something and which don't. Um, and so you can imagine problems abound for, for a historian. And uh, we're going to see that in tonight's presentation. I put a little schematic on this little whiteboard uh, to show something of the, uh, of the event. But it's, it's a complicated uh, incident. And so we'll see if we can make heads or tails of it by the end of the evening. Uh, when Bob asked me uh, if I would come and speak about Lucky Bill, I said, sure. Uh, and then I got off the phone and thought, there's some problems with this. First one is, uh, by the time we're done, it's going to be perilously close to my bedtime. Um, the other thing is this Lucky Bill, my Lucky Bill project uh, was some years ago and uh, some projects ago for me. So I had to go back and look stuff up. And the third problem, um, I don't have any slides on this, and I didn't have any, uh, uh, I didn't have a PowerPoint presentation or anything. Uh, it's a complicated story. So I do have uh, a little movie editing machine at my house. And so I put together a 20-minute video that uh, we can see that just tells the outline of the event. And, uh, and then we can talk about it more afterwards. Uh, now, one of the problems in 58, and in 1858, the record keeping was pretty shoddy. A lot of times in counties out in the territories, uh, the uh, records would be kept maybe behind the bar in the saloon. Um, I'm sure that most of you know the Mormons were the first settlers here in Carson Valley, and then they get recalled to Salt Lake City, and they take the record books with them uh, when they go. And so that caused a, a huge row out here and a huge problem. <sighs> Another problem is that uh, the newspapers from that era are not to be trusted. Well, from this era either. <laughs> um, those days it was even more serious because uh, they didn't have reporters in Carson Valley or in this uh, uh, Utah Territory and the Nevada Territory. Uh, they had a couple people that acted as correspondents at different times, but the main way that the news uh, got from Carson Valley to newspapers, and the main newspapers were uh, in Placerville and in Sacramento, and if it was something big, uh, San Francisco would pick up the story as well. Um, but uh, the news was carried primarily by the uh, stagecoach drivers, or the stage line, and, and so they would pull into Placerville and tell the folks there what was happening in Carson Valley. And then we have to judge OK, but whose side was the stage driver on? Who's he representing, and what's going on with that? The thing that you'll notice about the video, uh, I showed it to my mom a few days ago. She's sitting right here in the red. Uh, and she, she said, hey, there's no pictures of Lucky Bill. And that's another problem with uh, doing something in 1858. Uh, there really weren't any cameras out here. And uh, there's no pictures of Lucky Bill. There's no pictures of several of the key characters in this story. Uh, the ones that uh, I could uh, scrape up, I've, I've included. Another problem with this is that the first history uh, about this incident wasn't written until 25 years after it occurred. And that would be uh, History of Nevada in 1881. Uh, the editor was Myron Angel. And he wrote up an account of what happened with Lucky Bill. Uh, it wasn't until 60 years after the event that the second writing about uh, the incident took place. And then that was um, uh, A.M. Fairfield was the man's name. And he did a history of Lassen County. And so, but this was 60 years after the event. So um, when he did his, when he wrote up his uh, uh, story about this event, one of his chief uh, uh, people that he talked to that was telling, giving him the information was a man named William Dow. William Dow had come down from Honey Lake and was on the jury uh, when Lucky Bill gets tried. Um, but William Dow at the time 
uh, that he's being interviewed by A.M. Fairfield, a man that's writing for him, because he was a very old man at that time, a uh, guy that's writing for him writes a letter up to Fairfield and says, uh, you're going to have to come down uh, soon. Mr. Dow's mind is slipping. He knows it. And uh, so he's asked if you're going to get information from him, come down right away. <coughs> this is, this incident takes place before the Comstock load is found, is discovered, uh, before the telegraph comes through this area, and before there's law uh, or government in the territory. There have been a couple false starts. And in fact, Lucky Bill is involved. He's right in the middle of all this stuff. And uh, as we'll see is uh, when I start showing this film. There's one other thing that uh, I want to, uh, are there enough chairs back there? OK, good. Um, one other thing that we need to talk about for just a minute before I show the film is uh, uh, the role of uh, vigilantes in that era. And uh, now Bob writes about this stuff and uh, knows more than I do about this. But I know a couple things. And uh, one is that the vigilance committees uh, were generally looked really favorably. Uh, regular residents would look favorably upon these uh, vigilance committees when they begin, but as they uh, keep, uh, keep going, uh, they're looked at less favorably. In 1851 in San Francisco, uh, things were out of control, and uh, uh, there were groups. The Sydney Ducks was uh, one of the most infamous groups uh, at, in that era. Uh, there were others. In 1851, they form a vigilance committee in San Francisco. They arrest 90 people. Uh, 41 end up being released, four get hanged, uh, one gets whipped, and 28 people get deported. That same year, 1851, in Downeyville, um, a man uh, breaks into a, a woman's house late at night. She stabs him to death, and uh, a vigilance committee or, well, a group of uh, people come and take her out. They have a trial, a rump court of some sort. And uh, she gets hanged from the bridge there in Downeyville. Uh, and that, uh, her name was Juanita. And she gets hanged. And that story spreads, you can imagine, across the country. And in fact, ends up in the London Times, where they're showing how crazy the people out in the Wild West are to hang this woman from the bridge. In 1856, in San Francisco, the uh, vigilantes, they restart the vigilantes. And uh, that's because uh, the judges and police at that time were uh, seen as being corrupt. They couldn't be trusted. So uh, a bunch of people form another vigilance committee. Uh, that group hangs four people, four men. Uh, one man commits suicide while he's in custody. And there are 30 uh, deportations. Um, but one of the things that happens at that, uh, with that vigilance committee is that they end up arresting uh, the California uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice, a man named David Terry, who's a, uh, a huge story in his own right. Uh, he was a big, tough man. He was the uh, Chief Justice for the State Supreme Court, and he carried a Bowie knife. What happens is uh, one of the vig or somebody that is accused by the vigilantes uh, uh, seeks his protection. And he says, yeah, I will. I'll, I'll give you protection. The vigilantes come for the guy. A brawl breaks out. He pulls out his Bowie knife, and he stabs one of the vigilantes in the neck. Uh, he severs the uh, carotid artery. And uh, it looks like the guy's going to bleed to death. Uh, David Terry turns himself over to these guys, to the vigilantes. And now they're in a really tough place. What do they do if this guy dies, and, and they've got the state Supreme Court justice? Holy mac. Well, uh, it turns out by some miracle the guy does not die. And so the vigilantes can save face. They can release David Terry. Uh, and he can get in some other trouble down the road. But, um, uh, but they're out from under it. But you can see that these uh, vigilance committees, they can be very effective. And then they're going to have huge problems as well. Uh, let me just do a very short thing now, uh, uh, read a couple things. One thing about the law in uh, Genoa at the time. Um, Judge Chester Loveland, 
uh, April 13th, 1857, in the court records, he writes, ordered that the appointment of William Carey, a supervisor, be withdrawn on account of absence and William B. Thornton be appointed in his place for the first district. Now, William B. Thornton is Lucky Bill Thornton. He is a supervisor in April, uh, in the spring of 1857. By the spring of 1858, he's going to be hanged. So um, George Springmeyer said in, um, and I, um, I think it was in Sam Davis's History of Nevada, George Springmeyer said, uh, fortunately, there was but little need for courts it was not until 1858 in the hanging of Lucky Bill that lynch law was resorted to, and even then there was no necessity for it. Now that is going to show, that's one of the themes tonight, one of the things that you're going to see, an awful lot of the folks here, an awful lot of the folks in Genoa in particular, uh, were on Lucky Bill's side. Carson Valley was predominantly supporting uh, Thorington. Uh, in 1859, uh, Captain J. H. Simpson comes through, and he's surveying roads for the uh, for the federal government out here in the West. And he says this: "Noticed along the road the gallows on which the vigilance committee hung Lucky Bill last June or July, a reported horse thief and murderer. Was astonished that the relic of such a season of popular agitation and excitement should be left to be uh, harped upon by every passerby." So we see that a year after. Uh, Thorington was hanged, uh, there still is agitation and excitement over this incident. It was a big, it was a big deal at the time. Now, see that the TV is shut off again. We'll see if it's going to work. Uh, uh, unless there's questions or anything someone wants to say. Well, I'll show this. Uh, this will give us an overview anyway of what, uh, of, of the story. Here is a rough map showing Lucky Bill's property in the valley, drawn by D.R. Hawkins, whose family settled in Genoa in the 1850s. Marked here are Thornton's two ranches and a toll road he built in Woodford's Canyon. Note that on DeGroote's 1863 map of Nevada Territory, Lake Tahoe was also called Bigler and that in the southeast or lower right-hand corner, Thorntons is listed. Thorntons' Genoa property included a house still inhabited and Nevada's first hotel. Thornton came to the Pristine Valley in 1853. He ranched, brought the first fruit trees into Nevada, and dug the first irrigation ditches. He also was a gambler. His neighbors thought highly of Lucky Bill. Pioneer Henry Van Sickle said many stories might be told of his good acts that would put to blush those who make great professions of charity and love, etc. But if a man gambled with him, he was quite sure to lose his money. The narrator of this has often heard him advise people not to gamble. Another neighbor, A. H. Hawley, wrote, Lucky Bill was a fine, manly-looking fellow an open, free-hearted man. Tis true he was a gambler, but he was a very true-hearted, generous man. Lucky Bill engaged in all forms of gambling, but his specialty was thimble rig, also known as the shell game. It involves maneuvering a small wax or buckskin ball beneath three cups while a spectator bets on its location. It's most often played to swindle spectators, the ball being hidden behind the player's fingernail and released beneath whichever cup is not chosen. Thomas Wren, in 1904, wrote that one of Lucky Bill's characteristics was a tendency to always help the weaker party in any dispute. He said hundreds of instances are given showing Lucky Bill's generosity and bravery. Many immigrants who stopped at Mormon Station had occasion to bless him for his kindness. In one instance, a husband and wife were being abandoned. Their partner owned a wagon and cattle that brought them across the plains. They had supplied the provisions. The provisions were gone. The wagon owner refused to take them any further. That night, the wagon owner was persuaded to take part in Lucky Bill's thimble rig game. By morning, he had lost all he had, including the wagon and team. 
Thurrington gave the man $15 and a new pair of boots, advising him to start out for California and never bet against a man playing his own game. Lucky Bill then gave the bankrupt couple the wagon and team and supplies to carry them to California. In another incident, after winning a wagon and team, Lucky Bill gave them back, signing ownership to the wife, not the gambling husband. <laughs> Emmanuel Penrod, who knew Lucky Bill, and in fact was on the jury that tried him, said, but for all Thornton would always have a sure thing, he was always ready to help the needy. And when he would win, he would give some of his winnings back, if he was an immigrant, to help him along, as he would call it. But when the story of Lucky Bill was written, there were two completely different versions. The first, in the history of Nevada in 1881, was recorded by Myron Angel. He said, the country had no handsomer or merrier citizen in it than Lucky Bill, a name given to him because of the fortunate result that seemed to attend his every action. In character, Lucky Bill was both generous and brave, and his sympathies were readily aroused in favor of the unfortunate, or which in frontier parlance would be termed the underdog in a fight, regardless of the causes that had placed the dog in that position. Angel would go on to say, hanging of Lucky Bill was an injustice. Many of those who hanged Lucky Bill were part of a posse that came down from Honey Lake. A.M. Fairfield, who wrote Pioneer History of Lassen County in 1916, felt that those vigilantes were justified. He said that some of the Honey Lakers knew Lucky Bill or knew of him in Michigan, and that he was known there as a gambler and associate of bad characters. Fairfield said that the whole country must have been once separated into two factions, those who favored Lucky Bill and those who did not. Mormons were the original settlers of Genoa. Judge Orson Hyde was sent by Brigham Young to organize the territory. Thorrington, who had little use for religion, was friendly with the members of the religious faction. He counseled them to avoid paying tithing, but he subscribed to one Mormon tenant. He took two wives. His town wife, Maria, was described as strikingly beautiful and had a son, Jerome, who at the time of our story was in his late teens. Returning from a trip to Michigan in the mid-1850s, Thornton brought back Martha Lamb, a young woman who became his, quote, ranch wife, living on his property out in Fredericksburg. The San Francisco Herald reported violent animosities between Mormons and newcomers moving into Carson Valley. Hostilities were avoided when the original settlers were recalled to Salt Lake during the confrontation instigated by President Buchanan, who sent troops to confront the Utah sect. Arnold Trimmer, whose family arrived in Genova one week after Lucky Bill's hanging, suggested that the real reason for it was to stamp out any evidence of polygamy once the Mormons left. Carson Valley historian Grace Stangberg tells two stories about Lucky Bill. The first is of her grandfather, H.G. Dangberg, leaving his claim in the valley. When he returned, Lucky Bill was seated on property with a gun across his knees. Lucky Bill asks, what are you going to do now, Dutchman? Dangberg moved further out to property on the East Fork of the Carson, reclaiming the original land many years later. Historian Dangberg's second story involves a toll road Thornton built up in Woodford's Canyon. The canyon was one of the great obstacles to pioneer travel. The river that formed it and the narrow strips of land alongside were littered with rocks and boulders, making it nearly impassable for wagons. Thornton collected tolls after building the road. In the 1850s, the cattle ranchers thought sheep were an all-devouring scourge. When Kit Carson and a crew of Mexican herders drove 5,000 head of sheep through the valley, not only did Thornton let them pass up the canyon, he earned the enmity of residence by charging no toll. One of those upset by Thornton's actions undoubtedly was William Ormsby, for whom Ormsby County is named. Ormsby, who came to the territory in late 1856 or early 57, quickly became Thornton's bitter enemy. The newcomer ran a stage line and was charged a full toll to run the stage through the canyon. 
Ormsby was an organizer who led the opposition to the Mormons. Jane Owens believed Ormsby had been a buccaneer with William Walker in Nicaragua. Whether true or not, he, along with Thorrington, was one of the leaders in an attempt to form a government on the eastern Sierra outside the influence of Utah. In the meantime, in Carson and Eagle Valley, Ormsby organized a vigilante organization called the Committee to confront the problems caused by the absence of law. Lucky Bill built the White House, the first hotel in Nevada. There, one night his friend, an ex-lawman named Uncle Billy Rogers, got into a fight with men named Sides, Abernathy, and Baldwin, owners of the Clear Creek Ranch and allies of Ormsby. The argument began over Martha Lamb, Thornton's second wife. Abernathy suffered a head wound. The San Francisco Herald wrote that the newly formed Vigilance Committee would give all disreputable characters notice to leave and that Lucky Bill and his mistress would be the first to walk the plain. Thorrington, another friend named Elsie Knott, Uncle Billy Rogers, a ranch owner named Lou Doles, and 15 other Genoa residents now formed a group called the Anti-Vigilantes. In December 1857, a man named Edwards killed a leading citizen of Merced County. Edwards escaped Carson Valley, where he sought out a man with a reputation for helping all who asked, Lucky Bill. Claiming that the killing was self-defense, something he maintained until his death, Edwards continued on to Honey Lake, where he went by the name of Coombs. Three months later, Thorrington led a posse of five or six men up to Honey Lake, searching for two outlaws. Catching one of them, Thorrington sent the other posse members back to Carson Valley with him and went to the ranch of a man he knew named Saul Perrin. He borrowed a fresh horse and rode to warn Edwards that it was suspected he was living at Honey Lake. When Lucky Bill returned to Perrin's, he offered to pay for the use of the horse, saying he borrowed $15 from Coombs. Edwards went to live with a man known to be handy at picking up other people's cattle. They lured a rancher to a lonely spot, shot him in the head and took his herd. They told neighbors the man had sold them the cattle before leaving the country. When the murder was discovered, Edwards and his associate disappeared. His associate was never found. Edwards returned to Carson Valley, again seeking help from Thorrington. Word of the murder had carried there, and Lucky Bill confronted him about it. Edwards swore he had nothing to do with it, and Thorrington took him at his word. Edwards stayed in the hills above Genoa. Lucky Bill sent his son Jerome to collect money owed Edwards to help the fugitive. Luther Lute Olds and his two brothers controlled 960 acres of Carson Valley's prime ranch land. Olds also owned the Cotton Hotel, which still stands on Foothill Road. The hotel was across the immigrant trail from a canyon used by the border ruffians to harbor stock stolen from those traveling to California. Rumors that Olds was involved were never substantiated, but Olds helped Edwards when he came out of the mountains, selling him food from the hotel on credit. Within 24 hours of hearing a rumor that Edwards was in Carson Valley, 32 Honey Lakers began the ride there. Neither Isaac Root nor Peter Lassen, the leaders of the Honey Lake community, rode with the vigilantes. William Weatherlow, the leader of the Honey Lake Rangers, started out but got sick and turned back. The riders reached Genoa on June 14, 1858, and joined with Ormsby and others from the committee. The report on the front page of the San Francisco Daily Alta included the following. On Monday morning last, before daylight, a body of armed horsemen, numbering about 100 men, charged into Carson Valley and took possession of all the roads and trails leading from the valley into the mountains. All egress was cut off from the valley by a strong armed guard, and those wishing to pass out or into the valley are furnished with passports. Thornton's house was surrounded, and he and Jerome were brought out. Many years later, D.R. Hawkins recounted, at the age of 12 in 1858 in Genoa, I arose early one bright morning in June to find the town thronged with armed men. They styled themselves a vigilance committee, and I soon learned that they had taken into custody William B. Thornton, popularly known as Lucky Bill. In company with my father and by permission of the guards, 
I went upstairs in the Singleton Hotel and saw there, at the far corner of the large room, Lucky Bill, bound and reclining on the floor. As we approached him, my father said, Well, Bill, what's all this about? And he replied, Mr. Hawkins, these men have come here to hang me, and I guess they're going to do it. Lou Olds and three others were arrested by the vigilantes. Uncle Billy Rogers was gone in California. Edwards was caught when Jerome lured him into a trap. Lucky Bill told his son Edwards' testimony would clear it. The prisoners were taken aside to Clear Creek Ranch, and the trial was held in the barn. The jurors were 18 members of the vigilantes, and 12 agreeing would provide the verdict. Edwards was convicted by his own testimony. The others, except for Lucky Bill, Jerome, Lou Bowles, and a handyman who worked for Olds, were acquitted. Jerome was released owing to his age. Olds and his handyman were found guilty of assisting Edwards, harboring a fugitive. Olds was fined $875, his worker was fined $220, and both were banished from the territory under penalty of being shot. This left only Lucky Bill to be tried. A newcomer to the valley, Chauncey Nowhere, who later became the first Secretary of State for Nevada, recorded the trial at Thorington's request. He told Nowhere that he was certain to be executed by the committee, and he wanted the evidence upon which he would be convicted recorded. Nowhere wrote that Edwards' testimony included statements that Lucky Bill did not know of his role in the Honey Lake murder, that he had denied it when Lucky Bill asked. A witness from Honey Lake said Thorington told him he did not believe Edwards was guilty. No other witness addressed the issue. The testimony that implied Lucky Bill's guilt was given by a man named Breed. He said that Lucky Bill had been asked about buying the murder victim's cattle by Saul Perrin when Lucky Bill was at Honey Lake. Breed said that Thorington replied that he was not going to buy them, but that he had made arrangements with Coombs to purchase them. The insinuation was that Lucky Bill had helped arrange the murder. Saul Perrin was not at the trial, so Breed's hearsay was the entire evidence used to convict the defendant. A.M. Fairfield apparently did not have access to Nowhere's trial transcript. In his book, he used Honey Laker William Dow's recounting of trial testimony. Quote, Dow says Edwards testified that while Lucky Bill was in Honey Lake Valley, he had helped plan the murder of the Frenchman. Because Edwards' testimony still exists, we know this statement to be directly opposed to the truth. William Dow was one of the jurors. During jury deliberations, Nowhere was asked to read back a portion of the testimony. As he was reading, he heard hammering. He looked out and saw the cross beam for the gallows being built. Grace Dangberg reported that at the execution, a young boy was chosen to drive the wagon on which Lucky Bill stood. When the weeping boy hesitated, Lucky Bill came to the rescue. Drive out, boy, he said. As for the other principals, most met with tragic ends. Martha Lamb was one of the exceptions. She married Lutold's brother David after he divorced his first wife. They moved to Inyo County where she lived with her family, including her first son, William Thorington, Jr. She died in an old age, a revered pioneer lady. Lute Olds, seated here on the far left, was another who avoided a tragic fate. He flaunted the jury's verdict. He lived many years in Carson Valley and never paid his fine. Mm -hmm. Jerome Thorington drank himself to death within a few years. Maria Thorington's mind snapped, and she lived in institutions until she died around the turn of the century. Edwards was taken back to Honey Lake and reportedly hung. Lucky Bill's friend Elsie Knott hid in the mountains with several other anti-vigilantes when Lucky Bill was arrested. His pregnant wife, frightened over the danger, lost her baby a few days after the hanging. She commented that Lucky Bill was twice as good as some of those that hung him. A year later, she was pregnant again. The baby would be born fatherless. Elsie was killed by a vigilante supporter in a dispute over a bridle. Sides, Abernathy, and Baldwin, at whose ranch the trial was held, 
suffered a different affliction. They purchased 500 feet of land on the Comstock. After developing their claim without success, they sold it. When it was taken up by John Mackey, it was found to be the heart of the Big Bonanza. They had let the richest mine in the world slip away. As for William Ormsby, two years later, he led a party of over 100 irregulars into a trap chasing Paiute Indians. Many of the party were killed. Ormsby was shot in the arm and the face, and the wounds were fatal. What might be seen as an appropriate summation of the incident was offered by Harry Hawkins, a descendant of Carson Valley Pioneers. He said, now whether it was just a put-up job to get rid of Lucky Bill, I don't know. Dad always told me that Lucky Bill wasn't the character that they figured him out. He always tried to do good for somebody. But he was a gambler, you know. other things that I can talk about, but we could, um, if you have questions or comments, we could start with that. Um, yeah? I wanted to ask about the Grace Dankberg story about the plane jump on HF Dankberg. Do you believe that to be true? You know, uh, I couldn't find any other reference to that any place in any history or any of the documents. Uh, I'm sure that it was uh, family history passed down, and uh, I imagine it probably was true. You know, uh, it was it was rough times, and it's what we talked about. What I talked about earlier with the records, um, they were pretty loosely kept, and uh, probably possession was you know a pretty big part of uh, uh, who owned what. So but you didn't come across any other I haven't. Jumps made by Lucky Bill. No. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. So. Well, it would, except that he, uh, I, w I kind of agree with you, except that uh, he also tried to get all the other land in Carson Valley, so <laughs> <laughs> he ended up with most of it. <laughs> um, anything else? The, um, some of the stuff that I, that was uh, a real brief telling of the story, and uh, that's why I put this stuff up here, because it twists in a bunch of different ways that really we don't have time to go into tonight, but um, uh, let's see. These guys, it, it breaks down uh, with these folks. One of the stories was that it was Masons. Uh, um, Fairfield said that uh, the Masons got involved. Ormsby uh, got a bunch of Masons to, to go in on this uh, against Lucky Bill, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, this guy Edwards had killed a Mason, uh, in Merced County. When he ran away, Lucky Bill protects him and lets him get away from the Masons. The Masons put out a reward and were looking for him. And so the, the fact that Lucky Bill crosses them uh, probably was huge. Uh, there's no proof of it. Uh, one interesting thing is that, that chance, uh, Chauncey Noteware, the guy who uh, records the, the uh, uh, events at the trial, uh, he himself was a Mason. And one of the things that showed there was him writing about the event a lot of years later on uh, his stationery that was uh, Masonic stationery. So, um, so it wasn't all the Masons that were after him anyway. Um, let me see. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that happens is at Honey Lake, Edwards, who is going by the name of Coombs, he goes to live with this guy, a guy named Mullen. And the two of them, they, they have other people that live by them, uh, one of whom is this W.T.C. Elliot, Ruff Elliot, uh, named for uh, the town of Rough and Ready, where he came from. But he was rough. <laughs> um, but uh, so these were neighbors. When this, the man's name that got killed, you might have heard it referred to the Frenchman. That was Gordier. It was his cattle. He had these really... Uh, cattle that were the best in the territory, and, uh, and so they were, uh, I mean, folks talked about these a lot. When they, when they killed him, they put a, a man named Snow, 
who was not the brightest man, apparently, but they uh, put him in Gordier's cabin. He was living there. So when the murder gets discovered, they go for this guy. These guys disappear, the two that uh, did the murder. Snow uh, didn't know anything about it, apparently, uh, but he's living in that cabin, and so the vigilantes come and get him. And an interesting thing in that, I, I'm... If I should say it because I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, that uh, uh, Lassen was involved in that when they go and uh, uh, get snow. And they take snow, and he says he doesn't know anything. And so uh, they string him up, but with his feet on the ground. And then they're going to pull him up until he talks. And they pull him up, and then they let him down. And he still, he doesn't, he's not saying anything. So they pull him up, and they let him down. And uh, he dies. And he's, he's strangled to death. And, uh, and so he got killed. And now uh, suspicion turns to other guys that live around these guys. And Ruff Elliot gets questioned. Well, Ruff Elliot tells the vigilantes uh, that he is, he'll go down and do detective work in Carson Valley and find out what's up. He had been a friend of Edwards. So he could go down there and get close to, uh, to see. There were rumors that he was back down in Carson Valley. <clears throat> so Elliot is the, uh, he was referred to in the, in the uh, movie, but not by name. He comes down, uh, gets next to Thorrington. Uh, the two of them go and meet with Edwards at one point. And then uh, he calls, that's when he lets the folks up in uh, Honey Lake no, hey, Edwards is down here, and that's when they come down. And uh, they said, uh, the newspaper report said about 100 guys end up coming into the, and only 32 left from Honey Lake. They say that they were picking up folks along the way, and that when they got down here, then uh, Ormsby had his vigilantes as well. And so it was a, a sizable group that takes control of the town. Lucky Bill, this Uncle Billy Rogers is a real fascinating character. Um, he had been some kind of a sheriff. Do you, do you know Bob? In yeah, the first sheriff of El Dorado County. That's right, El Dorado County. And he was uh, the military leader for the uh, militia in the 1840s. Yeah. And he was killed in the Battle of Bunker Hill. Yeah. And he was the one that dispatched William Burns as a militia leader over here to Carson Valley in 1851. And Burns became the first sheriff in this area. Oh, wow. I, I didn't know that. But, uh, uh, but Uncle Billy Rogers, then, uh, is Lucky Bill's good friend. And Lucky Bill, when they hang him, he sa uh, Lucky Bill tells him, uh, uh, he tells his son Jerome to tell Uncle Billy, if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. Okay. They, I guess he's, he thought maybe the anti-vigilantes could have rallied to his defense at that point. Um, now... The, the, I've been saying from the start that the people from Carson Valley, particularly Genoa, uh, they pretty much supported Lucky Bill Thorrington. And um, there was a man named D.H. Uh, Holdridge who uh, was living in Genoa, and Fairfield contacts him. Fairfield is the guy that writes the history of Lassen County. Uh, it's going to be published in 1916. He writes to Holdridge um, sometime after the turn of the century, and Holdridge writes back and says, uh, Holdridge says, Lucky Bill was considered a good neighbor and good to anyone in need, uh, but they did not approve of his other ways. And then uh, Fairfield had asked him, well, did folks in Genoa go in with the vigilantes that come down? He said, a very few went in with the Honey Lakers in capturing and trying Lucky Bill. And he underlined very and he underlined few. And uh, then he said, uh, uh, he does he does not know the names of any men who went in with the Honey Lakers. Okay. Now, this is one person from uh, Genoa saying that he didn't know anybody that went in with them. Um, D.R. Hawkins uh, has written a letter from Fairfield, and uh, he's going to respond in a similar fashion. Fairfield writes to him and says this. Fairfield says this. Had Lucky Bill and a rough crowd terrorized the people of Genoa and vicinity, so they were glad when the Honey Lake men, uh, when the Honey Lake men came and helped them in making the arrests. Uh, and uh, D. H. Uh, D. R. Hawkins says, decidedly, no. Only his enemies, Ormsby, Swanger, who was Ormsby's clerk, 
John Kerry, who was the judge in the case, and W.B. Uh, w. Wade, uh, all of whom had business differences with him, rejoiced. Okay, so he lists four guys that he knows of that went in from the uh, Genoa group. Uh, and when Fairfield asked uh, uh, Hawkins, did he know names of jurors that, were, uh, that took part in that, he said, I do not know uh, they were selected from the mob. And that was his. Um, I mean, they don't seem to be so upset that he's dead, but that Morgan is harboring Edwards. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about that in a second if, okay. if I don't run out of time. Okay. But yeah, why do they hang this guy Thorrington if you know, the, the evidence is so flimsy, or uh, apparently anyway. <laughs> the pro-Thorrington uh, pro people in Genoa or Carson Valley were... Uh, I, I tried to list as many as I could think of that, that I know said something about Thornton that uh, was favorable. Uh, and D.H. Holdridge is one, and the Hawkins family is another, and Henry Van Sickle is another, uh, D.H. Hawley uh, is another. There was a man uh, named Allen who was a lawyer in Genoa, and he uh, wrote to the papers. Uh, he was a correspondent for the papers at different times. Uh, so he would sign himself Tennessee, and he also was pro Thornton. Uh, Chauncey Noteware wrote favorably of Thornton. Uh, I had already quoted George Springmeyer. Stephen Kinsey, who was a leader in, in Genoa, was also uh, on Lucky Bill's side. Elsie Knott and, and his family, the Oldses, and uh, John Reese, who was the original settler in Genoa uh, and was Lucky Bill's partner in, uh, in a couple different business ventures. So, uh, so it seems like it seems to me that most everybody uh, in this area was supporting Thornton, except those that had business differences with them. Uh, Bob pointed out the other night there were rumors that uh, Dangberg was on that jury, but it was all rumors, and, and there's nothing to substantiate that, and we've never heard anything out of that. It was, it's kind of surprising that Grace Dangberg had that story in her family lore uh, about Lucky Bill stealing his land, because everything else she writes about Lucky Bill is favorable. So, uh, a little bit interesting. I have um, the actual uh, testimony as it was written down by Noteware. Uh, it appeared first in the Placerville Register and then in the uh, Sacramento Daily Union at that time. And the copy that I made all those years ago, you can see how tiny the print is. I'm going to... But I might read a couple of these things just to see what you guys make of it. Uh, first is L. M. Breed. Now, this is the guy. This is the testimony that's going to get Lucky Bill hanged, apparently. Um, okay, Sworn resides in Honey Lake Valley, um, about a half mile from McMurtry and Perrins. Two or three weeks previous to the murder of Henry Gordier, W. O. Thorrington arrived in Honey Lake Valley. He called at the residence of McMurtry and Perrin and wanted to procure an animal to go and see Harry Gordier's cattle. He thought of buying them. He got an animal and went away. On his return, he offered to pay for the use of the animal, remarking that he had no money when he procured it, but that he had seen Coombs since he had been gone and obtained money and now had plenty. McMurtry or Perrin asked him if, they had, uh, if he had bought Harry Gordier's stock. He said no, but that he'd made arrangements with Coombs to purchase them. Now, that's, that's the testimony, apparently, that, that they use. This guy, Saul Perrin, and his... Uh, now, I think McMurtry uh, rides down with, these, uh, with the posse from Honey Lake, but he doesn't testify at the trial. Uh, and Saul Perrin has never mentioned he's, he's not down here at that time. So, so it's this hearsay that... And, and then it's hearsay, and then you have to kind of think, okay, that means he was, you know, he was helping plan this, uh, if he's saying that stuff. Here is, uh, he, uh, here is Edwards' testimony. This is the murderer now. William Edwards sworn. Uh, my name is William Edwards. I reside in Honey Lake Valley. I know all the uh, prisoners at the bar by name. I'm acquainted personally with but three, Thorrington, Olds, and Austin. 
Thorington had no knowledge of the murder of Gordier uh, that I know of. I had no conversation with Thorington concerning the murder previous to the death of Gordier. He made no arrangement with me in regard to purchasing Gordier's stock when he visited Honey Lake. He told me his business was hunting horse thieves and murderers and that he came to my house to borrow money on which to return to Carson Valley. Later in his testimony, he says this. Uh, oh, he's talking about when he comes back down to, the, uh, to Carson Valley. He says, uh, Thorrington would not, uh, would not and did not let me stay around him. He told me that uh, he had befriended me once when in difficulty, but he wanted me to get out of the way, to go over the mountains, etc. And then the last thing in his testimony uh, that's relevant, he says, uh, at the time Jerome was sent, I denied to Thorrington the murder of Gordier. So that's, uh, you know, it's, he's pretty definitive that, hey, Lucky Bill knew nothing about it. Um, and then, someplace, I think. Oh, uh, this Ruff Elliot, who came down to do the detective work, he testifies, and he says this. Um, Thorrington told me he did not believe that Edwards was guilty of the murder of Gordier. Now, you know, that's the lead detective saying, uh, backing up what, Ed's, what Edwards is saying. There's no, I don't, apparently Lucky Bill did not testify because there's nothing, uh, uh, any place that, that shows that he did. So, but um, that leads us to Charlene's, what she's uh, asking, which is, why then was this guy hanged? Um, I've got about 10 reasons. Uh, <laughs> there's something that, if I have time, I'll go into if you're interested, but uh, he, at one point, had, had threatened Ormsby. And uh, because of that, uh, one of the guys who supported Ormsby here in Carson Valley wrote a letter to a newspaper and said, hey, what were we going to do? Let this uh, Thorrington go after all this? Well, he'd, he'd go after Ormsby. He'd try to kill Ormsby. So we had to get rid of him. That was, okay, so one thing was the threat to Ormsby. Another was the business dealings in particular, the toll road and this Dangberg thing, if that was uh, uh, accurate. Another, uh, and a big one, was the politics. Um, he, Lucky Bill was seen as being pro-Mormon, even though he was against uh, the officials of the church. The people, the Mormons, supported him. In fact, this William Dow uh, uh, talks of years, uh, or maybe a year later, being confronted by some Mormons about, hey, you're from Honey Lake. You must have been in on that deal. And he had to deny it. He thought they would do him harm if he had said that he had been involved. Uh, this, the whole Mason thing could very well uh, be a big part of it, since Edwards, uh, the Masons were definitely after Edwards. Um, and then there was gang activity suspected. You know, it was a lawless area, and that Lute Olds, the rumors about him being part of the uh, Border Ruffians, and they're running that stock over Horse Thief Canyon and bringing it back down to his place where they're going to sell it and that. Uh, never proved, but it was all part of it. That At the time, I didn't mention it in the movie, but uh, several other guys get arrested at the same time. And they're saying, hey, this is a gang operating out of here. And that's why Fairfield, uh, when he wrote down and said, hey, were the citizens glad when Lucky Bill gets taken away? Because were they threatened by, by this gang activity down there? And uh, Hawkins said, nah, decidedly no. But that was out there. That was part of it. And, and the Honey Lakers apparently really thought that was true. Um, Okay, then it's the suspected that he helped in the planning of Gordier's murder. And then uh, Arnold Trimmer said the polygamy issue. Um, and that was, uh, he thought, the main thing. Um, and then uh, the contagion that builds up in something like this. We've seen it, you know, you see a fight and everybody's going, oh, man, you know, yeah. With that craziness that spreads out. Well, and that is exemplified by Noteware looking out the window, and they're, and they're already building the gallows, and uh, the jury hasn't said anything. So uh, the, uh, the very last and the overriding reason that I would uh, think that Lucky Bill got hanged uh, was just his lifestyle. Okay. He, we see what, 
uh, what he was doing here. He was a gambler. He was consorting with reputed outlaws and real outlaws. We know Edwards. Um, and uh, as much as that, uh, even, maybe even more so, um, he encouraged individuals to go against the mores or go against the laws. You know, where was it? He was saying, hey, come on, everybody do what you're going to do. And, uh, uh, and let's don't be bound by the laws, whether they're the Mormon laws or Ormsby came in to try to to develop law and order in this territory, and I'm sure that was uh, a huge threat to him. So, can you think of other stuff? Yeah? Yeah, uh, do you mean outside of Carson Valley? No, or? There were, you know, and Bob can probably answer better than I can, there were uh, incidents of uh, problems that needed to be resolved, same kinds of problems uh, in the valley. Um, in one, Sides was accused, the Sides, Abernathy and Baldwin, their, their ranch, he was accused of murder at one point and gets off. And I think Ormsby might have been the judge in that. Okay. Right. Good, good, good. Really rough people. Yeah. And rough Elliot the same way. There's the political consideration. People might wonder why were people in Susanville even involved, but they considered themselves all the same community, and that's why the first gun was Isaac Ruth. Absolutely right. The they thought the natural boundary was the Sierras, and so they they were trying to form. Uh, a territory that included Honey Lake and Carson Valley and Eagle Valley, I mean, this area on this side. And so that's why they, they took stuff personally. And uh, Yeah, Bob, go, yeah, keep going. One other thing to show how rough, rough Elliot was, when the sheriff of Plumas County came over and tried to collect taxes in Susanville, on two occasions, Rob Elliot stood him off at gunpoint. What? Yeah, and he was, now, Bob, wasn't he uh, later put in jail for killing a man? Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. That was down in Inyo County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, no, these are rough characters. About these honey lakers, that uh, Captain Weatherlow, whose picture we saw, he starts out, gets sick, and comes, goes back to Honey Lake. He doesn't take part in this. Uh, but he led these guys, and uh, they saw themselves as Indian fighters. And they were going out all the time chasing and trying to uh, trying to kill Indians and uh, they're in the um, uh, Paiute Indian War of 1860 uh, they tell about this William Dow who later is on the jury but talk about him uh, kind of slitting an Indian's throat and you know they they jump these Indians and, and uh, these are rough men there uh, the vigilantes are rough and folks down here were as well but huh Uh, yeah, I've read uh, in one place that uh, it was 18 to 0. So I probably I should have put that in there. But you're right. <laughs> I have a geographic question. Uh, what were the parameters of Clear Creek Ranch uh, as it relates to? Uh, and the second is Fairfield in any way tied to the Fairfield Ranch uh, down in Topaz? I don't know about the, the no. ranch. And okay. Clear Creek Ranch, if you're familiar with the Stewart Indian School, well, okay, that was the Clear Creek Ranch. And then where the prison is, just east of that, was Manny Penrod's ranch, uh, whom you saw in there. And uh, previously, uh, Abernathy Sides and, and Baldwin when there had been law and order here in 1857 and 58 under Carson County, Utah Territory, the sheriff had been sent out to repossess that land, that ranch twice, and they put together a counter posse bigger than the posse and chased the sheriff <laughs> off on two occasions. They were rough. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? And 
that's a question that a lot of folks asked. And, and in fact, then the rumors start, hey, they didn't hang Edwards. That's why uh, uh, the uh, Harry Hawkins at the end said he didn't know if it was a put up job just to get Lucky Bill. Uh, that was the rumor down here that Edwards never was hanged. Now, a couple, two guys from Carson Valley, I believe, went with, uh, went with these guys and, and took Edwards, and they came back saying, yeah, he got hanged. Uh, but they also said that when he got hanged, he, he made a, a statement saying that uh, he had done both murders. He had done that first murder and Gordier, and that uh, Lucky Bill had known about it. Lucky Bill was guilty. The complete opposite of what we know the testimony in the trial was. So uh, that's a little shade. That was Swanger's clerk, uh, uh, Swanger. That was Swanger's testimony, and he was Ormsby's clerk. And he came back from that saying this stuff, saying, oh, yeah, he confessed everything. And uh, that's, it doesn't seem reasonable. It doesn't seem uh, logical. So, well, thanks very much. And Bob, thanks for helping out. Uh, thank